everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. We are talking to Richard Lane, um, who is a clinical psychiatrist and psychotherapist. And we're talking about his book, The Neuroscience of Enduring Change, Implications for Psychotherapy. I've learned so much about, this is, this body of work is fascinating, I think. Um, so another key part of this um, research is emotions. So I wanted to talk about the neuroscience of emotions and emotional regulation and what you found through um, working with the different authors that you've worked with in this book. Mm -hmm. Well, emotion has been a, uh, a major interest of mine throughout my career. And I, I think emotion is kind of the center of everything, particularly when it comes to psychiatry and also the relationship between your mind and your body and your health, right? Mm -hmm. And um, emotion is this, I think, miraculous function that our brains have evolved. Because at any given moment, we're always evaluating the extent to which our needs, goals, and values are, are being met or not met at any given moment mm -hmm. in interaction with the environment. Mm -hmm. And that calculation is, is like golden because it's an assessment of how you are experiencing your environment right now. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's continuous. Okay. Now, all of these assessments induce emotional responses of varying degree of you know, intensity. They may be very subtle. Mm -hmm. And they're influencing how our bodies respond. And we're always kind of anticipating what's needed next. And so we're kind of preparing mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a really important area clinically is the extent to which people are in touch with their emotions and can, are aware of and can feel their emotions. Mm -hmm. okay. um, when you've been subjected to trauma, for example, where you have bad experiences, it's very natural to want to avoid having those emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. so, um, so particularly if you've had trauma and been mistreated, you've been neglected or abused, you haven't had help from other people in talking about your feelings and understanding how you feel. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So uh, what ends up happening is that you have bad experiences and you're on your own and basically you don't know how to process them, so you just avoid them. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. That's often what happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yet, you're prone to having those negative feelings reactivated when you're exposed to stimuli that reactivate the old situation. One of the things about trauma is that it's, um, is that the, the trauma leaves an indelible impression, but it's not specific to those exact circumstances, but it's quite general. Mm -hmm. So even subtle reminders mm -hmm. of that problematic situation mm -hmm. can activate that emotion. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's a reason why people have ongoing emotional distress and are coming in for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we make the distinction between what we call implicit emotion, which is those bodily responses um, your heart rate changes, your hormonal changes, your approach and avoidance behavior mm -hmm. out of awareness versus your conscious experience of it and your awareness of the emotions. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we talked about in the 2015 paper was what we call the integrated memory model. We said that that there's three interacting functions that are always, whenever one is activated, the other two are activated as well. And those are episodic memory, semantic 
memory, and emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, for example, if you're in a particular mood, say a sad mood, you're more likely to recall sad experiences from the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you have, uh, say, mm -hmm. a very sad experience, uh, which is an episodic memory, and it's associated with a high level of arousal, that will basically mark it as important and contribute to the semantic memory, the generalizable scheme, if you will, of that situation. Okay. Okay. Um, similarly, let's say you have a schema, as we talked about, for interviews. Well, that's immediately going to, uh, the activation of the schema and the exposure to the situation will activate emotions and bring back emotions. And you'll the point is that all three are interacting with one another. Right. So like an example that we had, you know, when you're 10 years old, your teacher shamed you. So mm -hmm. like now you have shame as the association emotion that can be triggered and That's now right. kind of like associated with generally presenting my material. That's right. Making okay. a presentation is a bad thing to do. Right. Right. Because I remember that's, that's, that's your semantic knowledge. Right. So I feel like, oh, presentation. Oh, instantly shame comes exactly okay. okay okay got it therefore and we include avoidance behavior as part of that emotional constellation right so you're in right. the situation oh i i had the possibility of doing this interview i'm going to avoid it that's the emotional response that's right. kicked in okay right so the integrated memory model says that these three processes are always interacting so one of the things we pointed out is that it's what, this is what we're working with in psychotherapy, no matter what kind of psychotherapy you're doing. Mm -hmm. But different kinds of therapy look different, right? Mm -hmm. Like for example, CBT is you're trying to change your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to influence your emotions. Well, the therapies differ by the way they access this integrated memory model. So. Mm -hmm. CBT is accessing the semantic memory, all right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, emotion-focused therapy, where you're trying to activate emotion in the session, change emotion mm -hmm. with emotion, there you're activating, you know, emotional experience, the explicit kind of memories. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the kind of exposure therapy, like exposure to, you know, you're afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just put yourself in that situation, your heart rate's going to get going, stirred up. That's the implicit emotion, the mm -hmm. bodily, okay? right. the bodily response. Um, Versus the explicit, which is what? No, the explicit is the conscious experience where you're, you're, you're really trying to reactivate those old okay. painful feelings. That is that's what you're really trying to do with emotion focused psychotherapy. Ah, okay, got it. Okay. okay. As opposed to just putting yourself in the situation and feeling bad, but not necessarily with conscious awareness or right. reflection. Right. Okay, okay, got it. So um, essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, in all of those different types of therapy, have new experiences, new episodic experiences. Mm -hmm. that are activating the old problematic emotions mm -hmm. and activating the old schemas. And then with the interaction with the therapist, you're bringing in new, corrective, much more positive emotions that are going to, number one, be part of the new episodic memory of the session. But they're also, because the semantic memory of the schema has been made labile by being recalled and activated in the session, that new emotionally charged corrective emotional experience is gonna update that semantic memory. And then when you go to sleep at night, that's when it's gonna get reconsolidated. Got it. So like all these therapies have this kind of, you know, what we talked about three different CBT, um, emotion, 
Um, the uh, I, there was one more. Um, I can't remember what it is. Um, psychodynamic. Hy yeah, psychodynamic. So they're all kind of. I'm going to you know get into somehow your schematic um, or semantic memory. I'm going to or the episodic experience. I'm going to activate the schematic and the emotions, and I'm going to create new create corrective and positive emotions. They all kind of have that general. They do. To it. And so, and so, one of the things that I think is most important, you know, when I lecture to psychotherapists, you know, and mental health clinicians about it, this is a model um, that can be used in the event that psychotherapy isn't going well or if psychotherapy is stalled. Mm. To what extent? To what extent are these processes really being utilized? To what extent, for example, are we getting at really painful emotion? To what extent is that active? Sometimes, you know, it used to be thought that just activating the painful emotion was a good thing to do. If you don't couple that with a corrective experience right. at the time, it just makes it worse. It oh, traumatizing. It. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And I don't think that that was really understood before. Uh, right. So go ahead and activate that, but don't re, don't you need to hold that person with a whole different corrective view. That's right. Otherwise, find a way to add something new that makes it more tolerable. Uh, yes. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Got it. And then the kind of new things like watch out for the drugs it interacts with because sleep mm -hmm. is really critical. Seems to be sleep like, really critical. you know, huge. Yeah, CBTI. Really okay. Um, and then how about things like, you know, EFT and EMDR, which are different techniques that you use. Are they like a, a yet a different model? Because it seems like a no, lot of those, they seem to do the same thing. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I mean, so Les Greenberg, who created emotion focused psychotherapy, um, you know, was one of the original four authors of the 2015 paper. I mean, he really does believe that his therapy works this way. And, you know, I've talked to experts in EMDR, and they say, yes, this applies to their, how they think it works also. Okay? Yeah. So um, it's just a kind of a general model. And um, again, I think it, I think you just have to try certain things out and see if it works. And if it doesn't, uh, you know, try something else, maybe a different route. We don't think that the, the model is wrong. It's just, how do you, get these processes mobilized. Well, right, you need to know the, the structure. Yeah, you yeah. need to know the structure that aligns with the neuroscience of it all, because mm -hmm. otherwise, if you don't have the structure, you don't understand the fundamental structure and how it works, then you could be re-traumatizing someone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is actually huge. I hope a lot of psychotherapists can use and read your book because I think it and I think just from I'm, I'm, we're actually approaching us from just an ordinary consumer of psychotherapy and mm -hmm. what you should know but I think it helps educate the person who's looking for a psychotherapist and to answer like real simple questions like we have like is this working I don't even yes. know mm -hmm. um, but if you know that it's creating enduring change and you're having a different reaction to things you're moving forward and you got some momentum yeah, yeah. And, and it could be slight things, small things. It doesn't have to be some gigantic thing. Just That's like right. even working, right. like having setting up another five interviews, which you were kind of like, no, I only said I wanted to do five. And you find mm -hmm. like yourself setting up another five. You're like, well, that's new. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that wouldn't seem like a huge thing, but it seems like, yeah, it would be. It would be a thing that you wouldn't necessarily notice, but is, a, is proof that there is enduring change that is happening or updating. I yes, I, we don't have to erase the memories. I think we just have to update and modify. Yeah, I like it. Um, this has been so interesting. We've been talking to Dr. Richard Lane, who is the author of Neuroscience and Enduring Change, Implications for Psychotherapy. Thank you so much. Thank very, you very so much. It's really been a pleasure. Good. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you Good. so much.